Admit it, if you are honest, that maybe you enjoyed it, but for a split of a second at least, you were horrified. I mean, it's something horrifying to be in such an intense way the focus of all, of all desires of another person. Which is why, do you know that William Butler Yeats famous poem like, you walk, be careful how you walk because you are walking in my dreams. It's horrible to be somebody who, as a real person, walks in a dream of dreams of another person. It's a very claustrophobic experience. So again, this topic of neighbor is crucial, abyssal topic. I even claim that uh, we are basically, our basic fear is fear of the neighbor. And all racisms play upon this, this abyss of the other. And that's Incidentally, one of the sad things, for me at least, going on today, namely the fact of how, uh, did you notice how in the last two, three decades, our politics is defined by two, three features. One is that uh, uh, the only way to mobilize people, not just to do this technocratic administration, but to mobilize people passionately, is to play on a fear. The only politics of passions today is a politics of fear. And unfortunately, not only for the right, also for the left, fear of immigrants, fear of, I don't know, fear of ecological catastrophe, fear of the state, high taxes, whatever you want, fear of sexual depravity, and so on. I claim what is beneath this is effectively, is effectively <clears throat> fear of the neighbor. Another thing to be noted here is how sad thing about today is then how do we deal with the neighbor? You cannot simply swallow him or her. Neighbor is out there in its abyss. Which is why, again, I claim that this notion of love thy neighbor, it's something very radical. It means love thy neighbor, love this radical otherness. Not just love somebody who is like me. <laughs> uh, is that Today, the way we deal with it is tolerance. And here, I'm sorry, I don't have time, maybe tomorrow morning at the Restraint Seminar, I want to go with it because I'm now in intense dialogue with that wonderful book, but I have my critical, with uh, Wendy Brown's book on uh, regulating aversion. She draws, nonetheless, wonderful conclusions and asks the right questions. Namely, the basic problem is the following one. Why is the category of tolerance universalized to such an extent today. Did you notice how problems which 20, 30, 40 years ago were perceived not as problems as of intolerance, but problems of injustice, inequality, and so, they, so on, are today rephrased as problems of tolerance. Racism is today, you don't tolerate my way of life, whatever, but make a stupid experiment, the moment of glory of United States, uh, Martin Luther King, the fight for racial equality. I mean, I made a simple experiment. Go to internet, put some of his speeches, and put search uh, tolerance intolerance. Practically absent. Uh, Martin Luther King didn't fight for tolerance. He fought for end of exploitation, end of injustice, inequality. That was the problem for him. Uh, I mean, it would be even obscene and racist to say, for him, oh, we blacks want whites to tolerate us. You know, it's the same ridicule as to say, as if a feminist would have said, we want men to tolerate women. No, which is even a very obscene idea. Like many of my male friends would have said, I can somehow grant equality to women, but tolerate them never there. So, okay, well, that's, an, <laughs> that's another story. What's underlying this is something that should be called culturalization of politics. In our postmodern era, where economy is more and more reduced to something that experts do, just administration, the only conflicts that remain are perceived as conflicts of <coughs> culture. But now really, sorry to conclude, uh, this notion of neighbor is something terrifying, I claim. In what sense? In the sense that, again, neighbor is not the wealth of another person, as we put it, his or her inner life, what I see in you. No, this level is usually a lie. 
There is a wonderful poetic, but I totally reject it, a multicultural phrase which says something like this. It's supposed to be a deep insight. I think it's precisely pseudo depth. It's an enemy is someone whose story you have not heard. It sounds so noble, you know, like, you are my enemy if I just objectivize you, you there, but, oh, if I take care or make the effort of understanding you from within, oh, then I will see that you have your standpoint. Okay, up to a certain level, this is undoubtedly true, but I claim only up to a certain level. And the limits are clear if I simply paraphrase this or apply to a very specific case. Would you also be ready to say Hitler was our enemy because we didn't hear his story? <laughs> I did hear his story. I read Mein Kampf and so on. And what shocks me is how, no matter how horrible your politics is, you always can find a nice way, as we usually put it, to rationalize it, to tell yourself a story about it. So the radical conclusion here is that and I think this is another deep, deepest insight of Judeo-Christian tradition. It's that the ultimate truth, the truth of you as a unique person, where you really stand, is not when you go deep into yourself and the deepest sincere self-identification or whatever. At that level, we usually lie. That's not the ultimate truth, which is why, if you want to get this point, I, ad I advise you to read two books. One is Aldous Huxley, the English guy, Grey Eminence. It's the story of Father Joseph, Père Joseph, the foreign minister of Cardinal Richelieu in the early uh, 17th century, the Thirty Years' War. What's so fascinating in this person? He was, for that epoch, evil incarnated. The worst real politic manipulator, he concluded a pact between Pro uh, Catholic France and Protestant Sweden against Catholic Austria to prevent unification of Germany. So we can even say he is guilty for Hitler in a certain way, because, you know, it, it was because of his political plotting that German was not unified earlier as a nation state. We all know this is what caused First World War and so on. Now, what is the shock? The shock is that this same person ordering tortures, poisoning, blah, blah, was in the evening after his, done, his work was done, was writing the most precious of incredible depth uh, 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 mystical meditations. Absolutely, how should I put it in a vulgar way, top level, at the level of St. Teresa, whoever you want. It's un and this is what bothered Huxley. I think his solution is wrong, but this gap. The same, let's go to the East, a simple book by Brian Victoria, Zen at War. The same problem, we have undoubtedly authentic Zen Buddhist monks, like the one who was very popular, if some of you are old enough, in the 60s era hippies, uh, D.T. Suzuki, the great, huh? Yeah, but he was, in the 30s, 40s, he was not only totally supporting Japanese uh, militarism, but even was writing, like, justification of it, claiming that for the majority of people, this uh, unconditional obedience of military discipline, you don't think there is order, you do it. It's the only way to satori, to enlightenment, to overcoming of your... Fo so the same paradox. And I think the lesson of it is very clear, that when we who stand in a Christian tradition, when we speak about redemption, blah, blah, all this, is something totally different than this gnostic or pagan perspective of going deep into yourself, finding this inner truth about yourself, and so on and so on. Precisely, this level of inner truth is a lie, is the point of lying. So, now, believe me or not, but I will really conclude now very short. <laughs> so, just two concluding points from all this. Now you will tell me, okay, but this all my relativism and so on, we don't believe, you don't know where you believe, blah, blah. But uh, there are people, so-called fundamentalists, who really immediately believe. I don't have time, it will take another hour, to develop the whole line of thought. My conclusion is they don't believe. Not that they are not sincere, that they cheat. They know. That is to say, to be very precise, I claim that belief, what bothers me in at least some type of fundamentalist, is precisely 
you remember, for example, what's for me problematic in creationism as opposed to evolutionism? It's not that it's wrong, blah, blah. I don't care. It is that the presupposition is that you obliterate the gap between religious faith and scientific propositions and you treat religious propositions at the same level like Jesus has arise from the dead, becomes statement, a statement like this is the DNA structure of that animal or whatsoever. Which is why I think it's deeply significant that fundamentalists usually don't have any problem dealing with, uh, with, uh, with science. They love science. They all the time try to prove that, that there is no gap there. You have them in Christianity, creationists. You have them in Islam. You have them among the Jews. For example, I learned that there is a, a group in Israel which takes literally the prophecy that Messiah will come when a calf will be born with totally red hair. So they say, let's fasten the process, and they're making these biogenetic experiments to, 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 make, it, to make it happen. So uh, you know what's for me belief? Belief is something different. Belief is, for me, a kind of, there is always an element of a belief which is absurd. Belief is not, you don't believe in facts. To say, it's, to say, I believe in Christ, but fuck it, I prefer to sin or I don't take, no, you cannot. It's a belief which is by definition an existentially engaged belief. It's, for example, to give a pathetic example, it's ridiculous, but it's true. Anna Frank, if you read her memoirs, this is belief. When she writes, in spite of all the horrors that Germans are doing to us, the Jews, I believe that there is a divine spark in every human being. This total counterfactual crazy gesture. It's the same with human rights. Believing in human rights doesn't mean I look around, scientifically analyze people, I see at certain level they all have rights, then I say, oh, okay, I believe. No, it's an a leap of faith. It's a kind of a crazy axiom. You can be white, black, yellow, high, low, stupid. I posit it as a practical axiom. That, and this, this, this engagement is crucial. So the first paradoxical conclusion from this, I claim, is that the true danger of this kind of fundamentalism is not that it's a danger to secular knowledge, oh, if they take over, no science. That doesn't bother me. It's there the true end of belief. It's belief at its most authentic is endangered. So what is belief today? Let me go briefly, no, really, three minutes. <laughs> you are my super ego here, yeah. Briefly back to, back to Holocaust. To, I claim that uh, what the ultimate lesson of, when I spoke you know, about how we shouldn't play this game, God is the good father up there who somehow uh, uh, manipulates things and you can trust on him, everything will turn out well and so on. I think that with things like Holocaust, it's obscene to expect, oh, we don't know how, but mysterious are the way of the Lord, it must have some deep meanings, that it's somehow uh, justified. I claim, here I follow Hegel's reading of Christianity, I claim that it is what really dies on the cross is not, it's precisely this God. As Hegel would have put it, God as substance. God as this secret mind which benevolently controls everything. God as whatever we here do in a kind of higher unity, everything has a secret meaning and so on and so on. Because, I mean, here we should be, if you want to be Christian, be really a Christian. That is to say, it's not that we are here, God is there, and then God, from time to time, why not? He sends a messenger. Okay, things turn back, come back next time, and so on. The ultimate lesson of Christianity, of embodiment, incarnation, for me is that God is engaged in our history. What happens here on earth, it's not something that God observes from above. And the, the way I read it is that the death of Christ on the cross, which means... <coughs> 